Thank you for talking with me today. Could you introduce yourself and tell me a little bit about your history before we talk about the exhibits? My name is Jeffrey Pratt Gordon. I am a uh, Baltimore filmmaker. I started about 22 years ago working on a TV show called Homicide and John Waters' film Serial Mom and haven't stopped since. And um, we're at the close. This has been torn down and packed up, but we're at the exhibit for Johnny Eck. Why an exhibit for Johnny Eck? Because I wanted to share this remarkable man's life with other people. I began collecting Johnny X stuff in, I think it was 1995. It's been about 18 years since I started my collection. I never set out to be the steward of Johnny X life or the curator of the Johnny X Museum. It's just something that, that has grown over time. Uh, the more information I acquire um, or learn about, the more obsessed I, I have become. And um, it seems a real shame to have my collection in my house though I love being surrounded by it and it, it, it sparks a lot of conversations with first time visitors and it makes me really happy and inspired to be surrounded by things of his life. Um, it's a shame to have it in my home. I wanted to, I've wanted to for many years get it out there in the public eye and, and share it. It began with my website. Um, I think I started that about 10 years ago. It was just, I was like a carbonated bottle, you know, I wanted to do something and that was a way that I could share what I had accumulated and the knowledge that I had learned. Speaking of that knowledge, some people might know who Johnny Eck is, some people might not. Who is Johnny Eck and could you give, me, give us a little bit about his history, why he's important? Johnny Eck is a Baltimore native. Uh, he is he was born in the house at 622 North Milton Avenue, just above Patterson Park here in Baltimore. It was 1911. He had an identical twin brother. I'm sorry, he was a fraternal twin brother um, who was born completely normal. Uh, his mother did not know that she was carrying twins. About 20 minutes later, Johnny popped out. Johnny was, um, he was about eight inches long when he was born. Wow. Um, it was a horrifying experience uh, for some of the midwives at the time. There's stories of midwives fainting when they saw this thing. One woman said, oh my God, he's a broken doll. And that's what he looked like. He had nothing from the ribs down. Wow. Um, yeah. Wow. So he's a Baltimore, he's a Baltimore um, character. He's, uh, he's spent his entire life living in Baltimore in the same house that he was born in. Really? He died in the room directly below the, house, the room he was born in. He died in the living room. Wow. He and his brother were inseparable their entire life, neither married. Hmm. Uh, neither one of them, aside from being on the road and sleeping under you know, moldy canvas tents on hay bales or in a rail car, that was the only home they ever knew. Baltimore was their home. Um, they started their sideshow career when Johnny was very young and that was their only livelihood uh, for their whole, you know, their whole life. Aside from working with a screen painter named William Octavec, William Octavec is known to be a, uh, the, the, the originator of uh, screen painting, which is a, a folk art okay. that you see in the, the row homes of Baltimore, particularly East Baltimore, Highland Town, that area, wherein people would paint bucolic scenes of uh, red roof bungalows and swans in the little pond out in front. William Octavec was the guy okay. that sort of put that, that on the map. And Johnny lived right around the corner from their art shop. So okay. as, a, as a little boy in the off season, he would go to the art shop, he would learn how to paint screens from the Octavecs, and that was his passion throughout his whole life, was painting screens. Wow. And, and that's, that's slightly interesting because, well, like, my first introduction to him was the film Freaks. Um, I saw that early on in my life. And you, you read about sideshows and, and, and you see these performers and the way they're presented to the world is very one-dimensional and in some cases a skewed one-dimension, the, the amazing half-man or things like that and you're seeing them as these displays, but it's interesting how deep these people go. And in his case, 
while he was a sideshow performer, he had this other passion in art. He had a lot of other passions, and that's, you know, most people only know of Johnny from the movie Freaks. That came out in 1932. It was directed by Todd Browning, who had done uh, the Bela Lugosi film Dracula. Yep. Uh, it, Freaks was a passion project of his, and it shocked people when it came out. Uh, it ruined Todd Browning's career. Um, and I, I wanted to show that there was more to Johnny than just a freak. He didn't think of himself as a freak. He didn't think of himself as a person who had handicaps. In fact, he was just the opposite. He was a person who believed that he could do anything he set his mind to. I, I attribute part of that to, and he attributed part of it to his, his upbringing. His parents, his mother and father, completely embraced and encouraged him and instilled in him the idea that he could do whatever he wanted. This little half man had more drive than most people with both their legs and full health. I mean, the guy was unstoppable. And I find great inspiration in that. Um, I wanted with this show to describe that or reiterate the fact that we don't have any excuses. If this guy could do all the things that he did in his 79 years, we have no excuse. And to, to hold it at the Maryland Institute College of Art was, was I thought, a, a wonderful opportunity. One, because Robert, the twin, he's not in the picture, his, his twin uh, went to school here. They were oh, both really? artists. They okay. both, uh, painted, they did watercolors, they did drawings, pastels, charcoals, uh, they made uh, models and sculptures. They were very much into the arts. So to, to give their message to students, um, I thought it was very fitting to be here. Having gone to school for film, I was in a building with the arts program, and it's the school I went to seemed very devoid of inspiration. It was a building with walls and that was it basically. There wasn't galleries like this in the, the school and I couldn't, seeing this and seeing the, they had another exhibit at MICA, uh, uh, I don't know if it's still open or not, but the screen paintings, um, being able to bring that to the students, especially in a time when they're learning and looking for inspiration is a great idea and, and especially something that somebody might not think of off the you know, off the cuff as this is art or this is an artist, being able to see that, that this was a truly an artist is a way of, a great way of opening up students' minds. Yeah, and I think too that, that being an artist is not just the work that you create and present to people, it's how you live your life. Uh, you, you lead your life in a creative way. In a sense, you're an artist. I, I, I studied photography and art history. And, you know, when I got out of college, I, I I got involved with my film career and I, I stopped producing artwork or what I thought was artwork. And I remember talking to a professor of mine and saying, you know, I feel horrible, you know, I've got this, such this creative drive and passion and I'm not, I'm not generating work. And he said, what you're doing with your collection is, is, a, is a, you're a creative force in that. So I started to accept the fact that creativity comes in so many different ways. So yet yeah, Johnny was an actor. We know him from Freaks. He was in the first movie with Tarzan. Uh, the first Tarzan movie with Johnny Weissmuller. He played a bird creature. He ended up using that in the first three Tarzans. But he was a um, he was a sideshow performer. He was a painter. He was a race car driver. He was a photographer. He was a magician. He was all these different things. And the way he led his life, he was a showman. And he was creative in everything he did. And that was one of the challenges in putting this show together. I wanted to... Um, I wanted to show all the aspects of, of Johnny's life, and I approached it initially in, in, in a sort of a chronological way. And I quickly realized that to do a show chronologically for Johnny would not work because he did so many things in so many different periods that it was easier to break his life up into these multi facets and sort of categorize each section of the exhibit as a facet of Johnny's life. So I had a sideshow section which touched on his work with Robert Ripley and touring around the country with his brother. Uh, I had a section that was devoted just to family to, to really sort of build on this, this family background that he had and the tight-knit family that he had. And there was a magic section and then there was the freak section and then there was his model making and then the back was the, the, the watercolors and then the x-rated room. So, it was very 
intense, I think. At one point, the director of exhibits, Gerald, well, I was midway hanging the show, and he, he's, he had this look on his face, and I said, what's the matter? And he said, I don't know, it's like there's so much information here. At what point do the visitors take a moment and pause and reflect? And I said, yeah, I don't want the visitors to pause and reflect. I want them to be overwhelmed when they come in this room because I, 18 years later, am still overwhelmed at, his, at Johnny's accomplishments. And I want people to just have this barrage of information and really get a sense of the scope of this man's life. He maximized his life. And the moment that the audience can reflect or process what they've seen is when you go to the, uh, the, the part of the exhibit that had the watercolors. And those are hung very traditional. Um, when you're painting or you're drawing, that's, that's your moment of, of solitude. And that's, that's in the show where people can have that reflection. So those are the quiet spaces. Uh, certainly the back room that we had that was devoted to his um, sexual urges and desires, that artwork. Um, it was a very personal thing, so that was in the back, and again, very quiet, very subdued, almost austere in its presentation, but this was chaos. Which is interesting because while it's a historical exhibit, as you said, it was almost like an art show, not necessarily of his art, but also of the way that you presented it. It was an experience in and of itself, and that was, I know when I first walked in here, it was very much like, I don't know where to look first. Mm -hmm and your eye goes to so many different places, you could just get lost in here. And it's not a very big space, but for the amount of information, it felt gigantic. It did, and, and I, had to, I had to make a lot of decisions. When putting up the show, I had to scale back so much of what I wanted to show. I have so many, uh, what do I call them, complete sets, or, you know, I have the, the letter, here's an example, I have a letter from Jimmy Durante signed to Johnny and Rob with a photograph of Jimmy Durante with a um, first edition book of Jimmy Durante with that photograph on the cover that was Johnny and Rob's. And then I have a clipping from Johnny's scrapbook that has an illustration done by Robert Ripley of, of himself next to a potato that looks like Jimmy Durante. So it's like this full, you look in one box and you see all these different connections. And there are many examples of complete sets that I have that I was unable to show here. Speaking of which, of your uh, collection, how did you start this collection? I mean, it's a vast collection, but everything starts with one piece. How did that start? Well, I'm going to have to backtrack, and this is a true story, and it, it might get a chuckle. Um, when I was in college studying art and photography, I... Um, I was working with potatoes for the last year and a half of my college career. I was focused on potatoes. Okay. I photographed them, I took portraits of them, I ground them up and I used them as pigments and, and paints and I cast them in bronze and I grew them and I, like, I made sculptures with them. I did all this stuff with potatoes and in, in one of my searches for new potatoes I found a, a freak potato, it was a Siamese potato. It's like, wow, God, that looks like Chang and Ang. You know, it was, it was literally two potatoes fused at what looked like the breastbone. Okay. So that got me really interested. And so I went the next day to a supermarket looking for some freak potatoes. Couldn't find any. I went to three or four supermarkets. No freak potatoes. They all look the same. The following weekend, I was, I was on a motorcycle ride, and I went to a farm stand, and I found another freak potato. And I realized that or I saw a connection between these potato oddities and human oddities and the fact that I couldn't get a freak potato in a, a supermarket, I started thinking, well, wow, they're ostracized. Do they taste different? Are they not as good because they're different? And um, that led me to researching human oddities. And so I started reading about all the sideshow performers, Johnny being one of them, and I amassed this pretty large collection of freak potatoes and I took portraits of them and then I went to my human oddities books and I took the images of the human oddity that resembled my potato and like this I put them on acetate so you would see the photograph of the potato overlaid with the acetate of the human oddity and I made a potato freak book. Huh. And that's where I got 
familiar with Johnny Eck, and that was 1987 or 88. Um, it wasn't until 1995. A friend of mine said, hey, are you aware that uh, somebody bought this Johnny Eck collection? And I, di I was not aware, and I didn't even really know what the Johnny Eck collection was. And I, I searched and searched every antique store in Baltimore, Midtown, Howard Street, downtown Fells Point. I went to a mall, and it wasn't until I got to the last antique store, which happened to be the closest to my house, but one that I never frequented. And I was looking, each one of these antiques, I was looking for a sign, something that would let me know this is the place that bought all the X stuff. And I saw a paper mache skull that was on display. It was in the case right over there. Oh, yeah, I remember. Yes. Okay. And I was like, God, I bet Johnny made that skull. And I continued to look around, and then I saw a trunk, a steamer trunk that was right there on that podium, and it said Robert Alexander, and it looked to be of the period of uh, Johnny's career. And I opened it up, and there were letters and photographs in that. Wow. And I knew that this was the place. And I asked if there were any more interesting items, and the guy said, ah, that's all I have here. And, and I took that, I dragged that trunk home, and I opened it up, and I started reading those letters and postcards. And I, at the time, I didn't know who Robert Alexander was. I didn't know that Johnny had a twin brother. I had only seen pictures of, of Johnny Eck. And I read, and I looked, and I was, I was fascinated. So the next weekend, I went back, and I said, that, there's some photographs in that trunk, really interesting. You don't have any more? He's like, well, I got another box. This went on for two years. And at the end of every weekend, he would say, yeah, that's all. That's the last of it. Wow. And it was my, my weekend ritual was to bring two cups of coffee from the Daily Grind in Fells Point, two cigars, and I would go over and shoot the shit with Johnny, and his name was Johnny, too. <laughs> and I would shoot the shit with him and talk and talk, and he, he's been a friend of mine ever since, but it, he doled the collection out to me. And in that time, I started getting a reputation of you know, that Johnny Eck guy, and people came out of the woodwork. My aunt knew Johnny Eck, my uncle did, oh, i got to introduce you to, and so I started meeting all these other people that knew Johnny, and my knowledge increased, and my interest increased, and my artifacts increased, um, and it just, every little morsel just gave me that much more to chew on and that much more to search out. Um, I then went to all my letters that were written to Johnny or Rob, and I, I, I wrote a letter to every person that had written him. Wow. And some of these letters go back to the 40s. So I'm not getting a lot of response. I'm calling information. It's pre-computer. I'm calling information. You know, do you have a number for this name? Oh, no. And I'd call these people blind. Hey, did you know Johnny? I go, oh, that sounds for me. He was a carny. You know, my grandfather was a carny. And so it, it just really grew over time. And that's how it all started. That's incredible. And being, I, I guess there are introverted collectors, people who collect and surround themselves with it and then don't show it to anybody. And then there are kind of extroverts that put it on display. Do you see collectors as a way of preserving history that can be more specific? Like a museum will have maybe one piece from this person, one piece from that person. But when an obsession or an interest takes hold of somebody, they'll go and they'll get everything they can for that, you know, either event, person, whatever the topic is. Being a collector, do you see that as a unique opportunity to preserve a, a specific point of history? Yes. That's uh, my goal um, has always been to, to get as much of Johnny's life under one roof. That has been my goal. And it's not money driven. It's not greed driven. I'm not I'm not a hoarder. Um, these guys lived 79 years in the one house. They were children of the Depression. They didn't throw things away. Um, they had their whole life there, and they were a part of American history. I mean, without a doubt. And then within that, Baltimore history. You know, screen painting is Baltimore. Johnny is Baltimore, and everything that has, I mean, there were Natty Bow bottles that were, oh, yeah, that, I saw those that were over there that were old, they don't make them anymore, yeah. those, and, and 
you know, that Johnny drank that beer that was a local beer. So there's all these local tie-ins. Um, I'm not a hoarder, though my wife would say different. Um, I'm, I'm passionate about preserving this man's life. Again, like I said before, it's not, it was never my intention to do this at all. Um, I think there are collectors who, and I, I wouldn't say I'm an extrovert either. I, I'm a very introverted person. Okay. Um, but I want to, I do want to share this. I've always had at least one to two rooms in any home that I've lived in that were set up as uh, we call them the Johnny Eck room. And they were usually office, guest room, combos. Uh, but he's always been a part of my house since I've had this collection. And when I have new visitors, I, my wife calls it the Johnny X show. I'm sure she's over it now. Uh, no, she, that's not true. She's really supportive. But I do, I share it. I share it. I share it. I share it. I don't hold any of it back. And I've longed for a venue that would allow me to show a lot of it, a big piece of it, so that people could come in and just experience it. There were visitors, I can't tell you how many people came up to me and said, oh, this is my third time here, fourth time, and we've told this person, and they've come from this city, and they've seen it two times, and we, you know, that's a wonderful thing that he does inspire still. He's been dead how many years? 91 to whatever the year is now. He's been dead a long time, and he still inspires people and influences people, and yeah, it's, it's a good thing. Well, thank you for sharing it. Yeah, absolutely. Um, just a couple more quick questions and then I will yeah I got you, I, you know I can just keep on talking about it so don't don't cut it okay unless you think you've got enough and that's fine well we'll just keep going for now and then we'll say <laughs> um, looking at the exhibit uh, well let me step back nobody would say that Johnny had an easy life he was born at a or what a lot of people would see as a disadvantage and a lot of people have decent lives and see themselves at a disadvantage or they, they get down on themselves, oh, money's tight or this or that, and they get upset. But looking at some of the articles in the exhibit, or not articles, but uh, attractions in the exhibit, you had pictures that he had staged of like car accidents. Yeah. And it seemed like he was able to embrace this and not didn't seem to get down about it, but hold himself up and have like a humor about it. He accepted himself for who he was. And that certainly there were a lot of physical things that he couldn't do. Um, there were a lot of physical things that he could do better than a lot of people. He could run faster than most people on legs. Wow. He could, he was a good swimmer. Um, he could walk a tightrope. I mean, he, he, there were a lot of things that he could do that a lot of people cannot do. Um, but he can't carry a suitcase. You know, he, 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 there's a lot of things that he can't do. And his brother, he and his brother, his brother devoted his life to him at a very young age. Oh, that's incredible. His, there, there's a story that um, his mother told Robert, uh, you are your brother's keeper. It is your job to look out for him. And that was at a very young age. And Rob took it to heart, and Rob did, and no regrets. Um, I'm, I'm drawing a blank on your question now. Well, uh, that, that he was able to look at his, or... Oh, so his sense, I was yeah. talking about his sense of humor. Yes. So, yes, Johnny had a sense of humor about the way he was, and he loved cars. Whenever they saw a cool car on the side of the road or a wrecked car, they would go in for a photo op, and Johnny would do his handstand. I call him hood ornament, because he would, you know, he would just stand up like that. And the, I don't know if you read the, the uh, card that was next to that photograph, but... The story was that they were going from one, sit one city to the next for a show, and they came across this fresh accident. And they were in and about, looking to make sure, there was still steam coming out of the radiator, and they were looking to see if anybody was hurt. And the police arrived on the scene, and, <laughs> you boys all right? Oh no, it's, you know, we just came upon this accident, and then Johnny walked out from behind the car, and the cops saw it and fainted. <laughs> and, you know, Johnny would get a kick out of things like that. Um, and he would pose. There were times walking down the street when he would, um, he would just lay down underneath a car tire and start flailing and screaming, help, 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 I've been hit, you know, and, you know, horrify people. Um, there was a story, you know, when Johnny had his train on the road, he would do all the maintenance on the train and oil all the, all the wheels and the springs and the gears. 
And there was one time when he was down there with his oil can and a little boy came over and was fascinated and got to talking to Johnny about the train and the father just looked at him and says, do you, do you always have to dig a hole when you work on the chain, train? And Johnny looked up at the guy like he was, you know, had 10 heads and he, and he just stood up and says, I have to. And he walked away on his hands and <laughs> left it at that. So, Wow. Yeah. You know, he, I think wow. he, he embraced the way he was. And, um, you know, I think about sideshow performers and, and us as normals going to sideshows, there's that whole mindset of, oh, you know, they're being exploited. Well, they're not. I think it's the reverse. I think they're taking advantage of the people that are in the tent. You know, they have the upper hand. You're the sucker paying the money to see them. They're making your money. They're not suckers. Yeah. You know, what else are they going to do? There's not a lot of opportunity for a lot of people born different. And um, I think Johnny and, and others had a pretty good handle on what they were doing. And Johnny just took it to the nth degree in so many other ways. Excellent. Yeah, it's, it's, an, inspi and, uh, it's an inspiring story and something after seeing the exhibit and hearing the stories, I'm gonna personally try to keep in mind because as you said, he inspired you and it's that idea of, well, if he could do anything, what excuse do we have? And I look at my career too and, and all the different things that I've done in my career and I attribute a lot of that to what I've learned from Johnny. You know, I'm not just a production designer. I want, oh, I want to write now. Okay, I'm gonna write a screenplay. Well, I did it. I'm gonna be an actor, I'm gonna do, you know, I'm gonna do whatever I wanna do. And that's what he did. And I tell my daughter the same thing, she's eight, and I say, sweetie, life is what you make it. You know, fill it up in any way that you can. Fill it up and do it. And you might not be great at everything, but at least you can say you've done it. Johnny wasn't the best magician in the world. He wasn't the best photographer in the world. He wasn't the best painter in the world. But he did it. He did, he did some really remarkable stuff. Wow. Um, okay, one question that might lead to two questions, and then I think we're okay. We've got, I think we have more than enough now, but there is actually something I want to ask you, but well, go on. Three questions people always ask me. How did he go to the bathroom? Did he have a penis, and did he have sex? Are those any of the questions? No, those are okay, not the let's questions. Okay, let's move on. You can answer them. <laughs> <laughs> um, to my knowledge and in my research and my interviews, I do not have any evidence that he had sexual relations with anybody. Okay. Of course he went to the bathroom. Of course. Did he have a penis? I, I know the answer. Do you want to know the answer? Maybe it's better just to wander. <laughs> <laughs> well, I actually, to be honest, I probably wouldn't air that just... Because of your audience? Well, because of the audience, and there is that nice little mystery there. Yeah. What's your question? But, okay, so the house that he, he lived in his whole life, is that still around? It is still around. I, I bought it on, I settled on Halloween Day 2000. So you own it? I own the house. Wow. That's extreme collecting. That is. That yes, is. I bought it because I wanted to preserve that house. Uh, I bought it f five years after I began collecting, so I knew the importance of that house in, okay. their, in their life. Um, I think of that house and its importance to Baltimore like I think of the Poe house, the Gertrude Stein house, the Mencken house, what will be John Waters' house when he's not around, you know. There are Hopefully things, that never happens. I know. There are things in Baltimore that are so unique to Baltimore, and I wanted to preserve that. It's in an area where Johns Hopkins is expanding and growing and swallowing up all these abandoned houses. I didn't want Johnny's house to be swallowed up, torn down, taken away. So that was my motivation in, in buying the house initially, is to preserve it and ultimately open the doors to that house and have a museum in the house. So that be When I walked in that house for the first time, it was six o'clock at night, and I had never been in there, and I, I, you know, I peeked through the windows, and every, every letter was addressed to that house. You know, I mean, it's just yeah. like, it's remarkable. And I walked in that door, 
And the first thing I saw was his steps going upstairs. And I just imagined his little hands learning to walk and going up and down those stairs for 79 years. That was really a powerful moment for me. And it's, for the most part, untouched. It's what, the house was built in 1896. The family bought it in 1906. They were born there in 1911. Uh, the family lived there. They had an older sister, Carolyn, who was uh, 14 years older. The mother and father died in 1939, a month apart. And that was, that was their home. So that was an amazing moment to see that. I had seen pictures of Johnny deceased on the couch, so I knew to the left of the stair, that's where Johnny died. Wow. I knew he was born in that second floor front room. So I'm walking around and I'm just breathing in that history and, and I knew that it was right to preserve that. So I went through this whole process to get it declared a National Historic Landmark, which involved, I, I made a, I had a, somebody make a scale model of Johnny's home. Okay. And then I had scale models of, of and photographs of what it would look like as a, as a museum. Okay. And I teamed up with Elaine F., who is the, the founder of the Screen Painter Society, was friends with Johnny. Um, and we, we presented to the Board of Historic Preservation. I also had the Historic Preservation Society on my, ho on, on my side. Um, so we hit it from a, a folklore standpoint, we hit it from uh, Johnny Eck as a personality standpoint, and we hit it from an, an architectural preservation standpoint. And we presented a slideshow, and Elaine talked, talked, and I, I spoke, and it was unanimously voted uh, by the city, yes, let's save it. Excellent. So I have now 800-pound doors on the front and rear. A friend of mine's a metal fabricator, and okay. he and I designed these doors uh, with quarter-inch angle iron going through the threshold. And got all these gears that we took off trucks that we welded together. And there's one skeleton key. It weighs almost two pounds. It's made out of steel. Wow. You have to stick it in there and you have to turn it several times. And what that does is it, it moves these gears. There's one giant gear that goes into the brick. Okay. And as you turn this thing, it, it takes the, uh, the gear out of the brick and then the door opens quite easily with one finger. Uh, and then the, the shutters on the front and rear are 400 pound half inch steel each. Wow. So it's fortified. Getting in there. I hope not. You know, I didn't, there are so many crack houses in that neighborhood. I didn't want it to, uh, turn into another crack house and burn down. So as of now, it's fortified as best as I can do it. And when money drops from the sky or somebody feels like I do and they have money that uh, they want to put it towards preserving it and renovating it, then Excellent. that's when we'll do it. Okay, and now here's my last question. Is there a holy grail of collectibles and, and the collection that you don't have yet, that you know that you want? That yes. You there are two, and I don't want to talk about what they are. Okay. I know where they are. I know okay. what they are. They are the Holy Grail. Okay. And um, if they're meant to be in my possession, then they will be, and if not, then that's what's meant to be. Okay. But yes, they are, they are driving me. Uh, it always seems like when you were the collector, or you're talking to a collector, and a serious collector, there's always that one or two or three pieces that they know they really want. And that's, that's almost the sign of the true collector, is because there's always that something to drive. There are, but then, you know, what's beyond that? What if I achieve that? What if I do acquire those, those items? Am, am I going to be done? Is that, I mean, is that the end of the story? And, you know, I don't know. I, I don't, in some ways, I don't want it to, to end. I guess that's a question, an answer that you will find out someday, hopefully. Yeah, you know, I've, I've gotten to um, a different place in my mindset uh, that if I were to finally realize the, the two books that I want to do about Johnny's life, um, one's sort of a, a biography and the other one is, is geared more towards his artwork. Okay. Um, and then, do, you know, finishing my documentary I think if I were able to achieve those things, then maybe I could get this collection away from myself and I would be content. But then there's also the, the separation anxiety. Uh, but I, I think, you don't I'm, think, you could, I, I think you I'm at that. a point where what's important to me now is information okay. and learning more. It's not so much about owning 
the physical objects. It's, it's about the information. And the information that I seek um, holds a lot of value to me because I want to know more. I want to know more of what I... I, I want to know what I don't know, you know? And Yeah, I think, I think I'd be content to I let it go. But one thing I don't want to do is, is part out my collection. I've been offered a lot of money for a lot of different items, and my answer has always been no. I will not sell it. I will not part it out. I think it should remain intact in one place. And dream scenario, Smithsonian, okay. American History uh, Museum. I think that would be a wonderful home for the collection. Though it's not in Baltimore, at least it's close, and I think they would do it justice in how it was displayed, how it was preserved, and there's enough information that they could revolve the exhibit every couple of years and keep new people coming. That's incredible. Yeah, I think that would be nice. Um, and I lied. That got me one more question. Okay, let's go. And then I, I promise I swear I'm done. Um, being a collector and all, not all of these, or all of these objects are old and they're just getting older. That's passage of time. They're going to only get older. What do you do to preserve them and keep them in the highest quality that you can? All the, um, the photographs and the letter, all the ephemera is kept in archival sleeves and archival boxes out of the sunlight in a climate controlled environment. Okay. The physical objects, the, um, the picks and the shovels and the, you know, the, the tools and the podiums and the stools, those are kept in a safe, okay. um, which is fireproof. Um, everything is pretty well protected. The train is, um, not in any box or wrapped up. It's in a, a friend's garage. It's, the train was running from the time I bought it up until the show. Okay. Um, right a week prior to the show, I, I and some friends painted it back to the original color scheme. So it is protected from rust, and, and that way we stripped it down to the metal. We primed it a couple of coats, and then we put several coats on top of that. So it's protected in that sense, and it is out of the weather now. The clothing is kept in, in boxes indoors. I've not mothballed them yet. I don't want them to smell like mothballs. Yeah. But uh, they're, they're in vessels that do not allow moths okay. and okay. crickets and other things in there. So I'm doing my best to, to preserve these things. Well, that's a good jumping off point for anybody who is trying to start a collection and they're not sure what to do with stuff once they get it. So that's a... Yeah, I mean, for years, I mean, the stuff was just tossed in boxes, you know, it was, and I would pull out the boxes and I would show them to everybody. And I try to remember to wear white gloves, but I don't. And, you know, I really should, but I don't. Um, the negatives, um, I, I am very careful with the negatives. Um, and I'm still scanning. You know, I'm still finding images that I haven't seen. I've still got over a thousand images to, to scan. Wow. And so, uh, so it's... There's a lot of my collection I haven't seen yet. There were documents that I found in preparation for this show that I hadn't seen before because I hadn't gotten to that box yet. So you're always learning. I'm always learning. So I'm, I'm still discovering things. Uh, search is on. I guess that's truly the way to feel fulfilled is to always be learning and always finding new stuff. Yeah, they call me a curator for this show. And I, and I, and I was wondering, if what is a curator? Am I a curator? Because I don't think of myself as a curator, I think of myself more as an archivist. Even more than being a collector, I think I'm an archivist. I wonder if it's the setting. I don't know. I think I would be a curator if I was getting things from so many other people and trying to build this whole thing, but 100% of everything in here was mine. Yeah. So it's, maybe I've been curating this show for 18 years, I don't know. And well, thank you for doing it. Thank you.